found online at alltrek.com. In 1778, Captain James Cook anchored off this coast, and soon it was named Nootka Island. Located on the west side of Canada's Vancouver Island, Nootka Island is rooted deep in history, as explorers and fur traders were regular visitors here a few centuries ago. Northwest Outdoors is here for a visit to Nootka Island Lodge on the southern tip of Nootka Island. Accessible by boat or plane, Nootka Island Lodge was built to be the base for adventure seekers looking to take advantage of this area's incredible sport fishing. Nootka Sound is a unique, unique place. It's, it's not that far from Seattle or Vancouver, BC, but it's still remote because you know the access to it is uh, limited. The lodge sits right on the water. Um, I mean, you can't get more oceanfront than this, and uh, we're fortunate that the sea conditions here are normally fairly calm compared to a lot of places on the west coast. Uh, we have a big reef off the west side of Van our Nootka Island uh, called Badger Reef, and that protects us from a lot of the major ground swell and stuff. And like anywhere else, we can get some rain, but you know, the summer months are usually, usually pretty good, and uh, normally day in, day out, we can always fish. Very few, few days that we can't go fishing. Fishing here can range from trolling the shoreline of one of the many islands in the area to skirting the edges of the Pacific Ocean. Because of the location on the outside of Vancouver Island, this waterway is a major highway for migrating Chinook and silver salmon. Halibut fishing is also popular by going out a few miles from shore. You're on board on one of the lodge's 16-foot aluminum catamarans with guides Steve Gunn and Matt Fitzsimmons as they search for salmon. It's the tail end of the fishing season, but these guys know there are plenty of fish still around to catch. Come on, buddy. We're point a point here. We just hooked a nice, looks like a little Chinook. Could be a coho, though. It's a fair-sized coho, if it is. Oh, he's a nice, it is a coho, I think. Nice one. Big northern again. It's a dandy coho, eh? Let me swing the boat around here, Matt. Beauty coho. Lovely one. Beauty. All oh, right. A nice coho. Some nice fast action. Yeah, right off the bat. Beautiful little coho, nice northern, about 10, 12 pounds, I'd say. Put up a decent little scrap, he hit pretty hard. Nice fish. What a beautiful day, eh? Awesome. This is tough to take. Fishing for these large salmon, guides here like to use fresh bait. Anchovies so are preferred. Using one. plastic holders kept in place with toothpicks, toothpicks each in guide places the hooks pretty much in the same place. I, I kind of like hooking my hooks right in the, right behind the dorsal fin in the middle of the back like that. So you got a hook on each side if they grab them. Some people stick them in the sides, but I think they hook better just like that. We'll just put it in the water and see what happens. This is a good area here where we're fishing at. Any spots around here for, uh, should have a chart. Look at charts and stuff first so you know the areas and that. Never hurts to have one on board if you ever get in the fog and stuff because we do get a lot of fog here. And uh, just a good thing to always know in any new area you go to fish in. But. Uh, once you get to know the area, you just fish the structure and it's easy fishing. Not always calm like this, but it's a beautiful area to fish, lots of fish. As you can see, we're right off the edge of the kelp line here in the rocks. A lot of times the bait fish and fish hide out in there and waiting for their prey to come spinning by like ours is doing right now here. And hopefully we're gonna get a bite here, but just Seem to hug the shoreline in tight. Fish seem to, the tides push everything in, the bait fish and that, and the fish hang around here. There you go, there you go. He's there. 
Tell me it's a chai. Lie to me if you have to. Sorry, I'd like to, but... This is when you want to hear that big pump on the other side going off with a big chai on it. Probably not that bad. Come on, buddy. salmon this size usually go back in hopes of landing a bigger catch. As the search for a big Chinook carries on, this is a great time to take a closer look at this part of Vancouver Island. With the apparent beauty of the area and the exciting sport fishing, the important history here adds to the attraction of being a visitor. Where Steve and Matt are fishing is McQuinna Point. A nearby stone monument marks the area where explorers Captain Cook and Captain Bly came ashore many years ago. Nootka Sound is rich in, in, in history. Uh, it's the birthplace of British Columbia. This is where it all started. Uh, Captain Cook arrived here in 1778. Uh, when Cook first came, uh, actually Captain Bly, who was a lieutenant at the time, was, was on one of his ships. Uh, there's an island named after Captain Bly, called Bly Island, obviously. Uh, Friendly Cove is, uh, was a, is today still the home of the Malachip Mushlet people of the Uchalna First Nations. There's a lighthouse there. We have uh, two lighthouse keepers. Uh, one of the family's been there over 30 years. There is only one uh, native family still living at Friendly Cove. Uh, Ray and Terry Williams, and uh, they've been there, well Terry's been there since she was a little girl, and uh, so they've been over there probably 60 years, so it, it's, uh, like I said, Nutka is known historically, probably, you know, was known more for its history than it ever was its fishing, you know, before we started back in 1983. The Mowichit Muchlet people began occupying this area of Canada some 4,200 years ago. Known as Uquat, meaning the wind blows in all directions, it is now referred to as Friendly Cove. Many structures line this beach at the turn of the century, but now only a few buildings remain. The Government of Canada has recognized the important part these native inhabitants have played in the history of this rugged part of Vancouver Island. When I'm bait fishing, I always like to use these rubber snubbers on my uh, release clips. You hook your line, and when the fish hits, grabs your bait, these stretch, and it, it stretches and it usually sets the hook before they feel the weight of the cannonball so they can spit it out. Any little trick you can find that seems to work, you might want to stick with. That's a pretty good one for bait fishing, though, just for helping set the hooks and stuff. Plus, you can really hear them when they hammer it off the clip, come all the way up the cable, the punk of it snapping back. It sounds pretty neat. See if we can get it down there and hear that. Fishing shallow on this side, 22 feet. There's fish here, uh, May, you know, May right through September. May and June are mostly uh, what we call feeder springs or feeder Chinook salmon. They range, you know, 5 to 20 pounds. Your bigger fish, your migratory fish, start showing up at the end of June. And you know, they're ranging in the 20 to 40 pound range. Uh, the biggest one this year Another was 58. That's a big fish for Nutka Sound. Uh, th that's on Chinook. Your coho, they can show nice up in guy. June. And coho, uh, they feed crazy. They, they're constantly eating during the summer. And they're the last to spawn. So, but they also move in and out. Where the Chinook, once they show up, usually the fishing's pretty it's consistent good. because Life they're coming here. They're not transient fish. Uh, you know, these fish are actually coming and ha they have to come past us. Uh, the coho, probably the best time for coho is uh, end of August, uh, September, and uh, the biggest coho I think to date in the lodge is about 19 pounds. Set the hook! 
Fish on. Right on. There's a shit up. Fish on. Right on. He's on the surface, coming to the boat. Nice one, nice too, one, eh? Yeah. Oh, he's a beauty. Here he comes. Nice silver one, too, eh? Great. Oh, he's a hog. Look at that, eh? Ooh, he's a beaut. Easy. Can't see him in the bloody sunlight. Come on out. Yeah. There he goes. Good tip for fishing out here. When you see your bite, grab the rod. If there's any slack whatsoever, you wind down until you feel tension. Palm the reel so when you set the hook, line doesn't spool out and you give it slack and lose it right away. Easy. Just keep your tip up as high as you can. Just like that. There's a beauty. And keep the line tight and you'll land a slab just like that. Yeah, there's a beautiful fish. Nice big tight. Right on. Beautiful there's fish. There's a beauty. That's what we're after. Nice and silver and bright. There's a nice slab. Beautiful fish. That's what we're after. Nice little tie. I should go up 31, 32. Anyways, I think. Dust come in from fishing here. Just took this puppy off the scale. A 33 pound Chinook. Beautiful fish, nice and chrome. We're gonna fillet this fish today. It's the preferred way to clean a Chinook. You get two nice slabs of meat off each side here. We'll start by cutting it right here. You just slit it all the way up the belly, like that. Key is to have a nice sharp knife, nice big knife. The bigger the fish, the bigger the knife. Then you take your knife right, right below the fin here, just slice down and across like this. And it's, it's pretty simple, really, to fillet a fish. The idea is the, sharp, the sharper the knife, the better. So you just take your knife now and I tuck it down here and I'll follow the backbone all the way down, like so. Just slide her down. You just gotta keep it at the right angle and you follow the, the bone down the whole way. Just like that. And one side done, pretty fast, pretty easy. No mess, no fuss, no muss. A beautiful slab of meat. And we'll take this, this half here, we've just taken off. This is what the customer goes home with, so we take the best care we can, get all the blood and stuff off of it. We want it to look nice when the customer opens it up and takes it out and put it on the barbie. Just scrape all this stuff off here. Just make sure you get all this stuff off. Then you run your knife, you can see all the blood in the veins in here. What not, and you just take your knife and scrape it up and it'll all come squishing out the top and it's important to get all that out because the blood is what will make it go bad a lot faster. So you scrape it all out, it's a lot nicer for the meat as well. How important it is to bleed them out. It's fairly important. When we're out there fishing, we bleed them out, we slice the gills. Right along here you can see I've cut it right in here. Right when you put it in the box, you, if you do it properly, you see the blood will squirt out and it drains most of the blood out. Same thing for the other side, just flip it over. Exactly the same way. Slice it right below the fin, cross like so. Same thing, just get your knife on the right angle and follow the bone all the way down. Just like that, and for identification, fisheries like, to keep the, like us to keep the tails on here so they can tell what it is. So we keep the tail on one side of the fillet. Same thing, beautiful chunk of meat and the rest goes into the water. In this part of the Northwest, rain is inevitable. Fog shrouded mountains are a common sight and certainly they add to the mystique of the area. A closer look at the landscape reveals more beauty on a smaller scale.
after a morning rainstorm made its way through, guides Matt and Steve waste no time getting back to where the salmon are hiding. Trying to catch a big Chinook on. We've been doing all right on the cohos. We'd like to catch a Chinook here. And I think this pass here is the one. The weeds have moved on a little bit further, and we can go a little further on this path. Fish on! <laughs> fish on! <laughs> Just troll right up by it and see if we can pull it off. <laughs> right on. Looks like a chai. Decent coho, if not. Maybe not, yeah. He's on there this time, though. Coho. Fishing Birdwood Point here. A little coho on here. A bit of an attitude. He seems to be scrapping a little more than usual. Which is nice to see. Mm -hmm. There we go. Nice size coho. He's a beauty coho. Let's keep that one. Yeah, maybe we'll keep that one. Beauty. Woo! Nice northern. Put up a decent little scrap. He's about 10, 12 pounds. Nice fish. Whether it's a Thai Chinook or a keeper coho, landing a big salmon is even exciting for full-time guides. As the sun gets lower in the horizon, it's time to call it a day. Most guests are lucky enough to take home a couple of salmon to share with family and friends. Nootka Island Lodge owner Tim Sear has a special way to cook up a filet on the barbecue. So we're going to make cedar plank salmon. We've been soaking this cedar plank. A cedar plank you can buy anywhere. Go down to the hardware store, buy a three feet of cedar, one by 12 cedar, cut it in half. The, the deal with this is you got to soak it for about 24 hours in fresh water. Take your olive oil, put her on the plank. Little olive oil, put her on there. Then you take your fillet of salmon. So it's a good sized fish here. Just stick her on the plank, just like that. So it's on the plank, you got your olive oil, got the salmon. The secret sauce here, and it's not that much of a secret, it's a Kraft Golden Italian Salad Dressing. And you just brush it on. This is a real simple, easy dish that anyone can do, and it, it takes a matter of 30 minutes to cook a filet like this. We'll just brush this on, get a nice coat. And a little more for good luck. Take a little parsley, and away you go, and some fresh lemon juice. So a little fresh lemon. And that's it. On to the barbecue. 30 minutes or so, and uh, just keep checking it. Once it starts flaking, you're ready to go. So our cedar plank salmon now is, is ready to go. And the nice thing about the cedar is uh, being, because you soak it for 24 hours in water, is the moisture cooks the, uh, helps cook the fish. So uh, you don't have to worry about uh, undercooked fish. And there it is. This show ends with a quick tip from survival instructor Peter Comerfield on quick shelters. You know, I've been a survival instructor for over 35 years of my life. And in the course of that time, I've debriefed many, many people that have been in survival situations. Do you know what the common denominator was with those people? 
They weren't as prepared as they would have liked to have been. Some of them were totally unprepared. When I get out of my truck, when I go fishing or hunting or backpacking, this is what I take with me. And in here I've got everything I need. Maybe you don't want to carry this much. So you can break it down into a much smaller pouch. If you had a pouch this size, you could be much better prepared than many of the people that have gone before you that found themselves in emergencies. Have the ability to start a fire a couple of different ways. A metal match is an outstanding fire starting tool, much better than matches. A good signal mirror to bounce a beam of sunlight to a passing airplane perhaps. Some flagging tape to indicate your position, make flags out of. A whistle, your voice is a terrible signal. A whistle lasts much, much longer. And perhaps most importantly, a heavy duty, giant sized Department of Transportation trash bag to shelter yourself. If you had these few things, you can survive. Survival manuals are full of diagrams of the kinds of shelters that you're supposed to build when you get in trouble. Debris huts and lean-tos and A-frames and thermal shelters, and it goes on and on and on and on. But what the authors of survival books forget is very often the survivor is injured, there may not be the resources to build these elaborate shelters, time may not be sufficient to build a shelter, the weather may not allow you to build these elaborate shelters, you need protection now. One of the most common products sold are space blankets, and they are sold by the thousands all over this country. Unfortunately, very few people ever take one of these out of the bag before they find themselves in an emergency. In the first place, if you are one-handed, and very often people that are in trouble have injured themselves, if you're one-handed, trying to get it out of the bag is impossible. To open it up is difficult, particularly in windy situations. And you're going to find that it's not big enough, it's very fragile, all you do is poke a hole in it and the whole thing blows up. It doesn't insulate you at all, it gives you a little bit of protection from wind and weather, but these are insufficient, they're inadequate when it comes to sheltering yourself. In turn, much better than space blankets are heavy duty plastic bags, Department of Transportation plastic bags. These are four mil thick, they're tough, they're the right color, they're totally waterproof and they make excellent immediate action shelters. Something that you can crawl into right now, protect yourself, and while you're inside there you can look around and see what else is out there that you may be able to capitalize on. The first thing that you do is cut yourself a hole out that is just big enough for you to pass your head through. Because you may find it's going to be too warm inside there. And in which case, one way to lose heat is to expose your head. So the hole that you cut out should be just big enough. It's also important when you cut the hole out, you go in at 90 degrees to the seam, to the fold here. And in that way, when you open up the face hole, you have a flat edge across the fold and it won't tear. If you cut in at a very shallow angle and come out at a shallow angle, you end up with a V that points right at the fold. It puts a lot of pressure on the fold and it may tear on you. On the other hand, with a flat edge, you put no pressure on the fold at all. It doesn't have a place to start tearing. And then it's simply a case of crawling into the bag finding yourself a place to sit and you're protected. It's warm, it's dry, it keeps all the wind off, it keeps all the moisture off. You have a signal working for you. Even if you go to sleep now, searchers still have something they can find. Unlike the household garbage bags, which are brown or green or sometimes black, this is a bright color and stands out extremely well. Plastic bags like these make very good immediate action shelters. Everybody should carry one. Other additional uses for the Department of Transportation trash bags include such things as using it as a ground cloth, carrying water with it, using it as a signal. I've even used it as a flotation device. You can inflate it, tie the neck off, and you can get up on top of it like a small air mattress. It's a very, very useful piece of equipment. The more useful, the more versatile, the better off you're going to be in a survival situation. To learn more about this show, number 1609, go online to northwestoutdoors.org. On the next Northwest Outdoors, fish the Potholes Reservoir on an airboat with fish 